Well, uh, great. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's uh, really nice to see this space filled with people and energy again. Uh, my name is Xiao Wenzhu. I'm the new director here at uh, CFCCA, Center for Chinese Contemporary Art. Um, actually, a fun fact, we were founded originally in 1986 by artist Amy Lai as a uh, community-oriented arts festival. Uh, and uh, many years later now, we're still here and we're the only um, nonprofit arts organization in the UK and even also in Europe uh, who's dedicated to the presentation and promotion of artistic practice uh, from Chinese East and Southeast Asian heritage. Um, tonight we are super excited to have Professor Jiang Jiehong Joshua uh, joining and uh, sharing with us his new book. Uh, I have it on my lap here. Um, the Art of Contemporary China. Um, so before we start the conversation, I just want to make a very quick um, introduction. Uh, so how we have structured tonight's event is quite straightforward. We are going to have a conversation about this book and also about uh, Joshua's practice for about 40 minutes. And afterward, we will show the UK premiere of artist Zhao Zhao's film, uh, Project Taklama Khan, uh, right here. That uh, screening will last for about 15 minutes. Uh, afterward, there will be book signing by Joshua at our reception. Uh, there's, of course, an opportunity to also purchase the book. And uh, if you have any follow-up question, you can converse with Joshua later. Um, and also wanted to mention that um, we do have an exclusive offer tonight <laughs> for two books. The other one uh, is the exhibition catalog of um, Harmonious Society, which was the Asia Triennial in Manchester back in 2014, curated by Joshua. So you can also consider purchasing two books together. So without further ado, um, please first allow me to introduce The Art of Contemporary China, the book, and our author here tonight. This book redefines Ch contemporary Chinese art in the last 40 years since the end of China's Cultural Revolution, placing it in the context of unprecedented cultural, political, and urban transformation. And a little bit about uh, Dr. Jiang Jiehong, uh, who many of you already know, uh, but just for our new audience in the house tonight. Dr. Jiang Jiehong is Professor of Chinese Art and Director of the Center for Chinese Visual Arts at Birmingham City University and Principal Editor of the Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art Intellect. His book publications include Burden or Legacy, From the Chinese Cultural Revolution to Contemporary Art, The Revolution Continues, New Art from China, Red, China's Cultural Revolution, and An Era Without Memories, Chinese Contemporary Photography on Urban Transformation. Jiang curated the 2012 Guangzhou Triennial, The Unseen, the 2014 Asia Triennial Manchester Harmonious Society, and the 2018-19 uh, Thailand Biennial, Edge of the Wonder World. Uh, so please join me to welcome Joshua tonight. So Joshua, really nice to have you here. Um, how does it feel like to be back to Manchester after so many years? Um, thank you for your kind introduction. And I just realized that how many years I haven't been back to the city after my curatorial work with uh, the Asia, um, Asia Triennial Manchester back in 20. Um, and I just been to this British art show. Um, so that's a British Chen Guo Meizhan, right? So I've seen um, the work at the um, Manchester Art Gallery, which I've been many years ago. And I've been to home again. Um, the, the, the one of the catalogs of the Asia Triennial was published by home, and there's a slogan um, on the wall at home, saying that roughly there's no other place like home. And I would say there's no other place like CFCCA. Oh, thank you so much. That is very true, at least in the UK and Europe. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. So uh, to me, I felt that um, it, it's, it's really like home. I mean, I met um, colleagues here, particularly uh, Hui Na, who we knew each other nine years ago when she was a school student. No, she wasn't. Um, um, and, um, and then, um, you know, it, it's a kind of reunion, this kind of feeling. And I kind of getting slightly emotional in some way. Um, uh, we, as one of the research centers, uh, focusing on Chinese contemporary art, uh, which is Ch um, Center for Chinese Visual Arts in Birmingham. It's kind of <coughs> such a natural collaboration between <coughs> CFCCA and CCVA. Um, but the collaboration stopped uh, in 2016, I think, um, with some reasons. And um, so I, um, I remember that I um, felt that um, it's such a shame that we didn't get a chance to continue the collaboration. Um, I was making a joke, we kind of divorced. Um, and we are re-engaged now uh, with this new um, wonderful new team and, I and your new book <laughs> yeah I look forward to work with you um, for for the coming years well thank you that's very yeah. kind of you um, let's just get back to the book um, could you first set us up giving us um, a little bit of context about how this book came about uh, was it a project you, project that you had in mind for a long time or was it something that got developed um, you know, during COVID more organically? Thank you. Um, yeah, um, this book was um, following my other book that I published with the same publisher, Thames Hudson, back in 2015 on contemporary Chinese photography. And um, and then I was invited to say, you know, would you like to publish another book more generally on Chinese art, uh, rather than focusing on one particular medium, i.e., photography or installation or whatever? And I said, yes, I, I'm, I'm very happy to. The reason, one of the reason being, is that um, I worked very closely with the team at Thames Hudson. Um, they've got a wonderful team, and I really like the team, and in particular, uh, the copy editors there. Um, um, but when I accepted this invitation, the challenge for me is that, because for, um, for this particular series, which is um, World of Art, um, it's a very concise um, series, and um, you don't, there, is a, there isn't a word limit, but you don't produce thousands and thousands of words for such a format of mm. publication. Um, that's one challenge. The other challenge is that I was not trained as uh, an uh, art historian. Um, I wouldn't call myself as a writer, I'm a curator. Um, and how can I write a book which is different with anything written by an art historian? And funny enough, just before my book, um, um, well, a few years before my book, uh, in 2014 or 15, Wu Hong published a massive book with the same publisher. publisher. And I was, why, why do you need another book on Chinese art? You can read that, <laughs> you know? Um, but on the other hand, I thought it could be um, interestingly challenging to see how the story of Chinese art can be told in a different way. Um, I mean, hi. Hello. 
I'm telling this story uh, in a curatorial way. Um, so we will, I'm sure we will come back to that. Um, when I say curatorial way, is that um, simply within this book, I'm not using a, a chronological order, um, strictly speaking. And uh, the chapters in the book can be easily uh, represented as four different exhibitions. Um, yeah, I stop here. Um, I, I, can, I can just see, you know, just like the pacing, how you, you know, go through your answer, it feels like you, you are already curating, you know, curating us, you know, get into the flow. Because my next question is actually about the structure of the book. Um, so for, for people who haven't had a chance to, you know, pick up the book, um, we do have them at the uh, reception, which you can pick up later. So the, the book comprises four chapters. Chapter one is uh, the collective. Chapter two is reinventing tradition. Chapter three is the art of urbanization. And chapter four is art at large. So um, I'm quite fascinated by this structure um, because I, I do feel like, you know, unlike a conventionally structured art historian book, this book has a narrative arc throughout it. And I was quite interested in how did you decide this narrative arc? And what was particularly important for you as the author to contextualize and illustrate? Thank you. That's a very difficult question, Shawan. Um, well, I think there's no book can be comprehensive to tell Chinese contemporary art, to be honest. Um, and nowadays, I just got back from Venice and Castle. You see the artists work there. You don't recognize them as Chinese, which is a interesting observation by many. And I think it's a good thing because we are living in the globalized art world. And this is how art should go. And to be honest, many years later, we don't talk about either Chinese contemporary art or contemporary Chinese art. We talk about contemporary art, or we actually talk about art, simple as that, um, rather than British art or British art show <laughs> um, or Chinese art. I think that's, that's something that we can park aside for now. But in terms of, back to your question, in terms of the structure, I was writing the structure or thinking about the structure primarily based on my curatorial experiences, uh, working with artists, working with or, uh, organizations, working with triennial, biennial colleagues. Um, and if you run into a wonderful restaurant, let's say, and you had a midnight feast with a loads of food and wine, and then you come back to your hotel room, and you lay down, and you think about the meal. Perhaps you can only remember two or three dishes. If this is the case, I was talking about those two or three dishes. Or maybe a young lady that I met during the meal. Um, but that's something that's more memorable in a way. And this is something that um, can be a sort of a shortcut for translational purposes. When I say translational, um, is the fact that the book is writing in English, and therefore the majority uh, audience will be English readers. So I don't know how much percentage, but <coughs> excuse me, um, but most of people or let's say at least half of them, maybe they've never been to China, maybe they don't know about Chinese culture, or whatever they know Chinese art, they will talk about Ai Weiwei. Um, but how can I tell the story to stop uh, the process of simplifying Chinese art to a certain person or simplifying the image of Chinese art 
down to one single image. That's the cover. It's not my choice, by the way. Um, so that's, that's something that it's really interesting to deal with, you know, when I'm working between artists, artwork, and their audiences. So that's, that's why I'm coming to uh, the structure of this four chapter. I think that's the most delicious dishes that I can share with colleagues. Thank you very much. That was extremely helpful. Um, the next question will, will get a little bit personal, if I, uh, if I may, because you are known as an academic and scholar in the field of Chinese contemporary art. For our audience here, especially a lot of the younger generation of artists, it may seem quite intuitive or natural to assume because you yourself were born, raised in Shanghai, educated in China, and then you moved to the UK to pursue your postgraduate study and PhD, and then eventually becoming a scholar and professor. Uh, but, but actually, especially for, for your generation, or even for my generation, um, it, it, was an, it was a rather unique experience, isn't it? And a rather unique choice to decide, you know, this is the path I want to pursue. Just because, I guess, percentage-wise, you know, it's still a very, very niche, you know, area um, in, in the general society who would pursue, you know, studying Chinese art, but also becoming a scholar in that field. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the fact what it was like to enter and explore the field of Chinese contemporary art, especially at its early stage, alongside other scholars and artists who were also your colleagues and collaborators, perhaps from the early 1990s to mid 2000s. Hmm. Okay. I thank you. I um, I never thought that I would go abroad. Um, I wanted to stay in China and my dream job is to teach in a university. Um, so to enable you to be, uh, to have the post in the university back in the um, 90s, um, you need to have a postgraduate degree, which is MA. Not, at that time we don't talk about PhDs. So for uh, a postgraduate, uh, you need to pass, you need to be really good in, in art, of course. And then um, uh, in compulsory, uh, as part of the compulsory requirement that you need to pass uh, two subject area. One is English, one is politics, Karl Marxism. So I passed English, I failed uh, politics. <laughs> So I, I didn't get into postgraduate, um, and I realized that uh, in the UK I don't have to do Marxism. Product. Marxism, yeah. <laughs> that was the reason. Simply, um, I came here. I thought I'd just come here for a year, uh, and then finish my MA and then go back to teach um, in China. But after that year, I've got a PhD opportunity, um, and then we got. Um, the, the, the proposal was accepted and so on and so forth. So I stayed on and then I have a child. Once you've got a child, you're stuck basically. Um, so um, yeah, she's doing curating at the moment. So, so yeah, um, life is too short. But anyway, um, what was your actual question? I forgot. Um, it was more like how did you get into this field and then just continued pursuing it? All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think especially maybe also for some of our audience here who are pursuing their graduate studies, you know, in curatorial studies or, or art history or particularly in the field of East Asian Chinese art. You know, I mean, let's be honest, it's a tough job market ahead, right? Mm. But um, I, of course, you know, I, I imagine you were a quite excellent student and scholar, you know, so for you, it, it just seems, you know, um, it has worked out for you, so congratulations. But then, but then, you know, because also speaking of my personal experience, you know, I didn't go to an art school initially. It's, it's something I had to discover just on my own. There is this, you know, contemporary art field. Um, and, it, and it's not quite mainstream, you know, yeah. even when I was already in university, almost feel like, you know, you would need someone to introduce you, someone to show you where the door is, then you know how to knock on it. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, I, first of all, I was trained as an artist, not as a, 
curator. There wasn't a curator course in China anyway. Yeah, it didn't so exist yet. They, they yeah. didn't exist. I mean, the earliest curating course maybe in the UK was set up in 1992. That's Royal College of Art. Um, I don't know whether there was any earlier course set up than that. Um, but I did my undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD all in fine art practice. So in fact, my PhD final show, uh, a solo show was here um, in 2002. At our old venue. In the in yeah. old venue, yeah. yeah. It wasn't, it's nowhere to compare uh, with the current venue, to be honest. Um, but I have to say that PhDs, they kill artistic life. Um, so I job uh, practice uh, when my PhD killed my artistic life and then I move on to do curating. However, I have to say that to do curating, um, I'm coming from a practical background rather than a historian background, which is quite different. Um, and it's, it's interestingly different. So when I first to uh, get into my curatorial pro project back in 2003, 2004, I met a few um, artists and the discussions with them is still very, very vivid. Um, I, I, I gl I, I'm glad that I recorded those conversations. Uh, one of the earliest artists that I met uh, was Zhong Hui. Mm. Um, he's my da ge, you know, he's my big brother. And Zhang Xiaogang, um, and um, Qiu Zhijie. Um, Qiu Zhijie was too young at that time as well. Um, so when I started to discuss with them, um, that was partially to do with my um, postdoc uh, research, which is to do with how Chinese art received impact from the decade of Mao's Cultural Revolution. And, and I felt that there's so much uh, that can be uh, uh, re-examined. Mm. Um, and it's, it's very, very different uh, with whatever you see in the West. It's not because the work was produced by Chinese people, it's because of the experience uh, in China. So that's one of the reasons that I, I discussed for a long time with the publisher about the title of the book. Mm. So we would call it Chinese contemporary art or contemporary Chinese art. But this book, um, I think I convinced publisher to say, you know, this is not only telling the story of art, but also the story of contemporary China. So everything, it's, it doesn't really matter. Even the artwork was produced by a British people. As long as the story is about China, that's Chinese art in my view. Thank you. That was uh, tremendously helpful. And since you mentioned a few artists who you encountered early on and they remained colleagues or even mentors throughout your career, uh, one thing also that triggered me, you know, while reading this book is that quite a few artists, they got mentioned a few times uh, for multiple projects, sometimes even overlapping uh, throughout different chapters, such as Wang Guangyi, Song Dong, Hu Xiaoyuan, Zhao Zhao, uh, who, whose film we'll show later, Xu Zhen, and etc. Um, so I, I just kind of like wonder, since you mentioned earlier that the way you structure the book is almost like highlights of your personal memory in a way. Um, so I was wondering like, how do you go about emphasizing on certain artists' practices, you know, um, comparing to the others? And also, is it more like a, um, an organic way because the writing flow, you know, just take you to this artist in this chapter, then you think of the same artist again in the next chapter, it just, it, just, it just feels natural to you to go about like that, um, especially because the, the book is about um, this quite broad subject, the art of mm. contemporary China's. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, as I said, that um, I was developing the book from a curatorial perspective, and therefore the chapters are like different exhibitions. I can easily think about, let's say, uh, chapter one, you've got paintings, you've got installation, you've got um, sculpture as well as video work. So there's 
different art media to construct, to shape um, an exhibition. Um, and when I shape an exhibition, I'm more focusing on the theme or the argument that I wanted to set up. I don't mind if one artist mentioned in one exhibition and mentioned again in another. Um, my profession at work is a researcher and a curator. My profession at home is a chef. Mm -hmm. So I cook every day, I love cooking. Um, so I, uh, uh, one thing that I uh, always use for many of my dishes is soybean sauce. So these artists, they are soybean sauce. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, yeah, well, this event is recorded, so <laughs> I don't know how artists will feel about that later. They, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, let, let, me, let, me talk about this, uh, let me talk about this soybean sauce story. Um, when I first landed in the UK, um, uh, after a week, I didn't have time. Didn't didn't have money to go to Chinatown. Um, I I I just do my sandwiches, and sandwiches such a strange thing, isn't it, um, to a Chinese person? Um, and you know, geometric, either triangle or or square, and with no taste. Um, <laughs> um, but but I I didn't realize how significant the smell of soybean sauce would be after I'd been in the UK for a week. Uh, and I was invited by uh, a friend that I met in the church and she cooked me a meal that was the soybean sauce, the most delicious meal I ever had in my life. That's one week when I detached from soybean sauce. And there is a famous book actually called um, uh, another, the, the other or another milk, which is talking about soybean sauce, the significance of the smell and the taste of soybean sauce in Chinese cuisine in comparison with milk or cheese in, in the Western thing. So yeah, that's a bit but that's what I'm saying that those artists, they are important ones. Mm -hmm. They are more significant in a way and they can be more uh, central in many uh, stories. Um, Great, now I'm sure they will appreciate that uh, yeah. comment. Yeah. Um, and then speaking of those soybean sauce artists, so I guess one of them could be Zhao Zhao because you, you picked his films to be included in tonight's event and we're going to um, show it just after our conversation. Uh, could you tell us a bit about this project and, and the why it, it feels so close to home to you and why you would like to present it tonight? Uh, yeah, uh, Zhao Zhao, I worked with him for uh, two projects, I think. Um, I mean, curatorial projects, not about the writing. Uh, one is uh, in uh, Mingsheng, uh, Art Museum in Shanghai, that was the exhibition 2016, and the Thailand Biennale. His project in Thailand Biennale was not realized. That's a, a long story, but it was a really interesting story. I am very happy to tell you a bit more when we have another chance. But for, for this choice to have him is that uh, when you're saying screening, that maybe audience straight to think about a video work, a video piece, narrative or, or fiction or whatever. Um, I'm thinking about, although the format is screening, but it's not really a video. I like the work that is less easy to be categorized, if you see what I mean. So when you see this work, you can see this is an installation, this is a performance, this is a video work. So there are different features within the work, and I think this is uh, one of the examples that uh, uh, I can share. Um, in, in, in this context. Oh, brilliant. Then we'll look forward to the film. Um, the next question is about something that I noticed uh, um, uh, seems to be missing a little in the book. 
uh, which is about the art market. Um, because as most uh, Western audience may know that um, the boom of the Chinese contemporary art market um, from the mid to late 2000s marked a significant shift of interest toward Chinese contemporary art. Um, but, but it doesn't seem to be really relevant to you, at least in the context of this book. So I was wondering, as a scholar and curator, are you concerned about this subject at all? Uh, or would you be influenced, you know, also by the art market when you choose which artists to work with? Yeah, I've got a student sitting down there whose PhD is on art market. That's her job, it's not mine um, in the future. But uh, I think it's a, it's a really pertinent question and I'm sure that a lot of publications are developed with the consideration of um, the art market and uh, uh, the different uh, phenomenon in the art market. Uh, but to be very honest, I, I put it bluntly, this is the least I will consider. Um, and in fact, that I, uh, I realized that I just, um, uh, two weeks ago, um, I write, I've been writing on my current book project. Uh, I'm writing some artists who can't sell their work at all um, but their work are really admirable to me. Um, and I also write the most expensive artist uh, in the book as well, that's Zhen Fan Zhi. Um, and um, so I don't, I don't really mind. I, I think this, is, this never come across my mind in terms of when I pick up an artist to see their, um, to see their um, market value. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that insight and transparency.